Um, I'm your facilitator. Uh, facilitation, eh, from French, uh, facile, easy. My, my goal is to make it easy for you guys to think, uh, for you guys to have a lot of ideas, and ideally to have at least one good idea. Uh, and at the end of the session today, uh, you will be presenting the result of your uh, common collective work to our clients. Uh, so hopefully uh, you take this exercise seriously. There is an actual issue. There's actually an actual uh, projection. There's a question. And we'll be trying to solve it together. Um, so I'm going to give the floor uh, quickly to uh, our friends. I think it's Mauricio who's going to talk now. He's going to introduce the issue, the question. And uh, we're going to get wor working in about five minutes. So as the okay. same, my name is Mauricio. There's Max. He's also a co-founder. And together with two other members, uh, we founded Cicli Menta uh, last year at the beginning of the summer. So Cicli Menta is an urban agriculture project based in NDG. Um, and the best way to describe it is by telling you this little story of a person who is actually factual. So there's a mom in NDG. She lives on the other side of the train tracks. She has three kids. Um, whenever she needs to get groceries, she needs to walk for at least half an hour, take three sets of stairs, over and under the train tracks, then a hill. Um, when she gets to the grocery store, she has to buy this wielded looking chaos from California. She pays an astronomical 350. Um, by the time she get home, she's really tired and she still has to cook food for her kids. So what I described to you is considered as a food desert, which is an area that lacks access to fresh produce. Um, there are many food deserts in Montreal. They have, there's lots of depanards, but if you want to buy a tomato, an apple, it's really difficult. So what we do is we grow, we implement micro farms in people's backyards, people's unused space, people who like to see their, their like a flourishing garden, um, we go, we implement everything. Um, from the middle to the end of the summer, we sell the produce in, to the Energy Food Depot, and the Energy Food Depot helps us distribute this produce in these areas that I just described here. So, of course, um, these are typically low-income neighborhoods. They are not going to pay prime money for this produce, so how do we subsidize the operation? Uh, what we're doing right now is we're selling microgreens um, that we're growing in the basement of uh, Coop La Maison Vent, who is a local partner. Um, we are selling to restaurants, cafes, um, and the revenues from those sales, we are subsidizing the, the whole um, harvesting farming operation. Also, um, for us, it's really important that we, we don't use fossil fuels. Right now, in the agricultural system, um, food system that we live in, there is a really big dependency from pesticides to fertilizers to distribution. Everything we do is done by bicycle within a two kilometer radius. We cannot do this alone. This is a community project. We have lots of collaborators, from interns to volunteers um, to, to local partners, other organizations. Um, and one thing that we've learned is very important is the intergenerational exchange, knowledge exchange that's happening. So someone has been growing. Obviously, uh, agriculture is a very old thing. It's not, it's not like news. So how do, we, how do we invite the people who have this knowledge to help us? We teach them what we know, they teach us what they know, we meet in a place, we, we exchange, we laugh, we play. Um, working outside is a lot of fun. And uh, we, our youngest volunteers are 15 years old and our oldest is our 50. And, uh, and we are working together on the same garden. So it's, it's a lot of fun. So this collaboration for us is really important. There's a big aspect of popular education in this project. We, we, are, very, we are very clear about not knowing everything, about learning together. And um, we like it. We're hoping to, to find a way of scaling this up. And scaling up doesn't mean that Cicle Menta is going to go into every other neighborhood of Montreal. Scaling up for us meaning how can we train people who have a similar interest in implementing the same project in their neighborhood so that eventually they can run the project autonomously and they don't need us. And how can we do that all across Quebec and eventually Canada? Uh, we'll get started. Uh, so thank you, Mauricio. Uh, thank you, Max, for submitting this, this very interesting issue. Uh, design thinking is, is basically a, a methodology, a, a way to approach problems. Uh, there are many representations, such as this one, uh, where you basically, and it's always more or less the same steps. You start with empathy, then you define a problem, you ideate, and then you prototype and test what you've come up with. Uh, there are, as I said, many representations. So this is a very simple one. Some more complicated ones will uh, include a certain 
a certain sense of iteration, a constant iteration between the steps. So you'll do a bit of empathy, you'll define the problem, you might want to go back to empathy, define again, ideate a little bit, come back to empathy. So you can move back and forth between the steps. And the very canonical example, if you want, of this is this representation here, uh, which was proposed by IDEO about 15 years ago. IDEO is a big Californian uh, design firm. Uh, there are about 500, 600 employees there, and they used to design products mostly. So they would design your new uh, you know, hair comb or you know, a hair dryer or, or car or whatever. And as they move forward, they started more and more to be interested in the notions of service design. So how do you conceive, how do you design something that's not tangible, something that's a service? Because services can certainly be designed. They can certainly be thought of as a, as a series of steps, as a series of experiences, much in the same way that a MacBook is just a series of experiences where you do stuff in a computer, right? Um, so they started uh, looking at that, and they worked with hospitals, they worked with schools, and further they went, the more uh, knowledge they acquired, they started even publishing some elements, uh, toolboxes, toolkits for educators, for people in, in the social sector. And uh, so all of this material is freely available online. Uh, you can check it out. IDEO is really a big reference for me. Really, the, the big idea is, is the notion of design, not so much as an act, because I'm not a designer. I'm a PhD in economics, so I, I know very little in, on design per se, I, I'm completely incapable in Illustrator, uh, but it, it's really to borrow the, the, this, this thinking of the designer and to apply it to social, political, uh, and organizational problems. So this is what we'll be doing today. We have an organizational problem, don't we? And, uh, and we'll try to kind of solve that, uh, borrowing from different influences. So these are the five steps we're gonna go through today, and we're gonna get started right away with the first step, which is empathy, good? Any questions so far? Everybody's happy? So empathy, uh, as I said, uh, is really the, the first element, the first brick of this process. It's, it's the, the part where we understand the humans. So in this case, we'll be talking about people and the food that they produce and the food that they consume and maybe the food that they buy. So this is going to be the, the environment in which we're going to be evolving. So we're going to ask the question of these people. and. We have a, 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 we have a challenge. We want to come up with a way to scale this operation without scaling a business. We want to use a toolkit or other people or, or to influence kind of other communities to reproduce this system without building a big pyramid uh, or organizational pyramid like, like we would uh, normally tend to do. So what we're going to do, we're going to, uh, we're going to make a very conscious effort at understanding uh, how and why individuals do what they do in this specific sector that, that we're uh, involved with. Uh, try to come up with an understanding of, of their needs, both physical, they need to eat, uh, but also emotional, you know, what are we eating, when, why, in what context, with whom, etc. So the first step is really just a warm up. We're not going to focus on the issue right away. We're just going to get our brain started. So what I want you guys to do is choose someone famous. It can be a, you know, a movie actor. It can be a, you know, an entrepreneur. It can be your neighbor that's famous. It can be anyone. Just pick someone famous and describe their relationship to food. I, we're just going to do this for two minutes. And so try to be clever and funny. So come up with like a one or two sentence that describes somebody's relationship to food. Anybody. You have two minutes. So get, get writing. Uh, so what we're going to do now, we're going to work in a team. So we're going to do this uh, as a collective. So I'm going to give you a, a, a short period of 10 minutes. And I want each group to come up with three personas. So these personas are people you can, that you may know or people that you can make up. They can be these celebrities that you come up with. I just want you guys to agree on three personas around your table. So it can be a female, it can be a male, it can be an, an Olympian, it can be a chef, it can be any, any type of people. What's really interesting is that we have different groups. So I'm expecting that you know, having three groups will have nine different personas. And I want you to describe their relationship to either or all of farming, cooking, purchasing food. I want. I want names, I want occupation, I want, I want to know what these people do, what they think about when they wake up in the morning, what they eat for breakfast. So I give you 10 minutes. You can split the work up any way you want, but at the end of the 10 minutes, I'm expecting every group will have three fully described personas with identities and names and people that you can relate to, people that you, know, you can kind of feel for, all right? Uh, 
Uh, we're we're gonna we're gonna take this one step further, actually. So now we've defined these characters, uh, and as I pointed out, I wanted you guys to kind of tell a story, right? Uh, please. Uh, so you you have these guys. They have names. They have occupations. They do stuff. I heard you debating whether they were, you know, they knew one another or whatnot, whether they were compatible. That's really interesting. Uh, what we're gonna do now is that we're gonna take each one of these personas and we're gonna break them down. Uh, in, in using uh, what, I, what is called an empathy map. So we're going we're gonna to use this tool. I'm going to show it on the next slide. Uh, what you need to know when you're preparing the empathy map is uh, you want to really adopt your persona's point of view. You want to pretend like you're this person. I, I know you guys had like a self-righteous vegan. Try to be empathetic. Like I know for me that would be really difficult, but try to, try to be this person for a couple of minutes. Uh, try, to, try to feel... Again, guys, try to feel what they feel, see what they see, uh, think what they think. And so, uh, you know, maybe you guys are self-righteous about other things. So try to use that, that feeling that you have in, in maybe your bikers, like really aggressive, you know. So try to use that feeling and then purport it to this other person and try to live what they live. So I'll give you another 10 minutes. What we're going to do, we're going to try to map as much as possible different elements. So I'm going to have you focus on the right side mostly. What, do this, what does this person think and feel when thinking or talking or, or, or interacting with food? What was the feeling? What, what's in their mind? What do they see? What do they want to see? They, want, they absolutely want their kitchen to be all green and full of basil and whatnot. You know what I mean? Like, what do they see? Where do they, uh, they go to the market because they think it's beautiful, etc. cetera. Uh, what do they hear about food? Is it maybe people talking to them? Maybe it's the nature? Maybe it's the silence? Maybe there's a bunch of thing we can, things we can hear. And what do they say and do about the attitudes that you've described? So I'll have you focus on, on these four elements for now. Try to be as... Uh, as rigorous as possible in defining your persona. Now we're really taking this person and breaking the person down into characteristics, and we'll be using that, obviously, in, in the next phase. So again, the definition period, uh, is, the goal is to bring uh, clarity, focus to our question, to, to narrow down the space in which we'll be designing. I like the, the metaphor of the sandbox. Again, you know, if, if you're trying to design something in the desert, you'd never know exactly where you should start. You know, whereas if you're in an enclosed space, you know what you have at hand and how tall you can expect to build your little tower. I would like you to guys to think uh, again, starting from your three personas, what types of relationships do these people have towards food? Do they absolutely love food? Do they need to eat? Do they, you know, they cultivate it with passion? Is it a place where they go when they need calm, maybe? And, you know, they, they cultivate away from their wives that they would like to divorce or, you know, stuff like that. So I would like you guys to come up. And, you know, we don't have a single relationship to food. I mean, I eat on the fly. Like, I, I admit I've eaten McDonald's maybe three times in the last year, you know, shame on me but you know again when you're in a hurry and you, you know you're going to a client and you've, you're starving well you pick up whatever you can and you'll eat that so that's a type of relation and sometimes I have people coming over on Saturday nights and I cook for the entire Saturday afternoon and that's another type of relationship that I enjoy very differently from my going to the McDonald's right so I want you guys to start from your three different personas and come up with as many relationships to food as you can imagine it can include as I said farming it can include cooking and it can include uh, purchasing food, going to the grocery with your significant other or alone or with your puppy dog or, or whatnot. All right? So I'll give you again another period of 10 minutes. Define as many relationships as you can. You might want to use the post-its for this one to, you know, stick it on top of the personas that you have already. 10 minutes. We're going to have you start from the list you just built. And now I, I would like you guys to focus uh, on the needs of, that are implicit in this. Uh, so I, was, I went around and asked all of you, are there categories that emerge between the different personas, between the different lists that you're building? So I would like you guys now to build not so many three different lists or three different types, but one overall uh, type or, or typology of needs. 
Guys, focus on uh, what needs are explicit. So what needs can th is this person conscious of having and able to express out loud? Like, I want to eat quickly or healthily or I want to lose weight or, you know, there's things that you are able to say. Then there are needs that are implicit so that maybe they will not be vocalized, but they can be kind of felt. They can be, uh, you know, drawn from one character to another or you see some people... Uh, using uh, such practices but, but not others. And then there are the latent needs, stuff that's not even invented yet that we could, you could kind of make up, that we could fill, uh, that people are not necessarily able to be conscious of. Obviously, the iPhone is an, is an example of a latent need. You know, we didn't know this such a thing could exist, and then there it was, and we all bought one, you know? So, uh, again, I'll give you a very short period of time, only five minutes. Try to this is only drawing from the list that you've just built. Try to come up with like meta categories of needs uh, for, for the, 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 the whole uh, of your personas. I'll give you five minutes and then we'll start the ideation period and we'll start actually addressing the question because you must be wondering what the hell is this guy doing, right? Well, you know, we've been preparing the ground. Now we're going to start working in about five minutes. All right, let's go. Five minutes quickly. We're going to move on now. Obviously, the objective so far, and, and this is, uh, this is uh, said clearly in the definition, so far the objective has been for everyone who's participating in the workshop today to gain a certain notion of clarity around the issue of food and relationship to food and growing food and consuming food and cooking food, etc. So what we're going to do now, now that you're fully bathed in the, in the issue, we're going to start ideating. And the good news is that this is normally a high energy period for the group. So I'm expecting at the end that some people will be standing up and you guys will be doing a lot of, of crazy stuff. So what I want you to do, I'm going to give you another very short period, this time again of five minutes. Um, I want you to keep in mind your personas. So in the back of your mind, what I want you to do is to start thinking about the issue. We want to scale this business, we want to we want to have this idea of uh, cycle alimentaire reach epic proportions without having these two guys as heads of the universe. So how can we do that? I want you guys to rapidly come up with as many possibilities as you can. So keep in mind your personas, but now just focus on really on the business side. Identify as many creative ways to address this issue of scaling cycle alimentaire. I want you guys to imagine context, places, delivery methods that will reach the personas, that will reach as many people. I give you five minutes. I want a hundred ideas. So you can stand up, you can use post-its, you can use more paper. Go. <laughs> And stop. So, there are good ideas here, good ideas there, good ideas here. Everybody's got good ideas. If you want to have one good idea, you need to have 100 ideas, right? So this was the point. I wanted you guys to generate a lot of volume. I do realize that having authorities around the table can be challenging, and I, I've witnessed that quite often. Uh, we tend to look for validation. and I. I Apart from lecturing and, and animating these seminars, I organized an event in Montreal called Fail Camp. I don't know if you've heard about it. It's a full day dedicated to the celebration of failure. And I'm not promoting my event. What I'm saying is that I've given quite a lot of thought to this notion of failure. And we have this very na natural tendency to try to avoid saying stupid stuff, especially in front of an authority, especially in front of somebody that knows better, right? We don't want to look stupid. We don't want to. So who in the, in the group here has said, we'll go to the moon and harvest f fruits and vegetables there? Nobody, right? Because you're kind of constricting yourselves to the reality. And so when we're doing the ideation, normally, and again, we're just doing this as an exercise. We want to feed our, our, two, uh, our two friends here. But in this ideation period, I would, I would urge you to go even crazier than what you've done so far in this exercise. We don't have the time to do that, but if we d would do another iteration, we would go even crazier. We would expand even broader the, the, the uh, horizons of what we're considering. And obviously, we'd probably eliminate the moon story. But 
from it, we could gather some characteristics, some insights, etc. So what we're going to do now, and you guys have written it down on one sheet. You guys have used a variety of post-its in the sheets. There's more post-its there. We're going to try and sort the ideas that we've had. So ideally, you would have had 100 ideas. I see there's about from 30 to 50 ideas per table. That's, that's plenty enough. I want you to gui guys to start building large categories of these ideas. So I know you guys, for instance, you had like podcast, blog, and nah, nah, nah. so clearly there's a sense of a category there to use online tools to, to you know, push the message forward. So that's one, don't start right away. Um, and so I'm just giving this example. So start building larger categories with, with your ideas, and then we'll see what emerges, and we'll be debating that just a bit later, and finally converging on a solution. All right? Let's give us ourselves six minutes. Shall we? Let's do it. All right, guys. So we're going to head towards the final stage of our exercise. Right? You have a bunch of, you have a bunch of ideas, some good ones, apparently. And you've organized them in categories. So maybe the, the arrangement, the organizing, makes some of the ideas uh, seem stronger than they were when they were only like in, in of themselves. So they're c combined or combinable with other ideas. So what we're going to do now, we're going to prototype one solution. And again, remember, an hour ago, you knew nothing about this. So don't fall in love with your idea. It's only a prototype. We're going to build a prototype. We're going to pitch it in front of one another. And we're going to gather some feedback hopefully from our, our two sponsors here. And that will eventually allow them to do maybe another iteration and then to finalize and, and find right, one great idea. So the first thing we're going to do, we're going to choose. I'm going to give you two minutes. You're going to try to pick w your best idea. Or if you don't have one best idea, you can combine a couple of ideas into one coherent solution. Or if you have a kind of an epiphany all of a sudden, you can actually define an even a new solution. But you have only two minutes. So you have to just pick. The only thing you have to do in the next two minutes is pick the best one or the combination of the best ideas and to come up with like a label. This is what we're going to do. And then for the remaining 10 minutes, we'll define what this idea will look like, how it will be operationalized, etc. All right? Two minutes to pick. That's all you need to do. Come up with, an idea, with a name. white sheet of paper. Maybe if there's a, an artistic talent within your group or somebody that writes particularly well, I want you guys to prepare kind of a, a deck or a, a slide or something, a drawing. I, I see that you draw pretty well. I saw that there were some personas. So anyway, whatever you want, use this canvas as you will. I want you guys to come in front, one or two people, not the whole group, and pitch your idea. And what you're going to be answering, the questions, is who are the stakeholders involved? And you don't necessarily need to answer all of these things, but keep these questions in mind. Who are the stakeholders involved? So if it's a blog, well, there are bloggers, and there's a web editor, and et cetera. If it's a bike shop, there's probably a couple of bikes. So stakeholders, what skills and what technologies will you need? Again, maybe it's a completely non-technological issue, but at least you need the skills of fixing a bike or riding a bike, for that matter. So they can be really basic skills or really advanced skills, like, like pitching in front of other people, going, maybe we have uh, Maurizio go around the world and give uh, these big seminars seminars like Al Gore and, and you know kind of evangelize the entire planet I don't know so skills and technologies what type of budget are we talking about maybe it's something we can do with a bunch of volunteers but maybe we need a grant a hundred thousand dollar grant from the BDC or the city or whatever where will this take place uh, is it are we scaling from the NDG to the plateau or are we going global right away again you decide. And finally, what results do we expect to achieve? Are we going to repeat this experiment? Are we going to make it bigger? Are we going to make it just smaller? Are we going to level it? I don't know. I leave it up to you. So keep these in mind. I'll give you 10 minutes to finalize this little presentation. You've worked on personas. You've worked on needs. You've worked on characteristics. You've worked on relationships. You've had 100 ideas. You've chosen one. All you need to do now is pitch it. And you know what? If it's really, really bad, at least we'll know that that idea is bad, and we'll move on to the second one next time, all right? So let's, let's do it. Let's define our ideas. 10 minutes. We'll, 
we'll go just a little bit overboard the overboard. So who wants to start? We need the mic. We need the mic and we need a volunteer. Come on up, guys. Let's go. And everybody else. All right. So it's a, it's a two-minute pitch, and there will be no questions. Okay, so um, the first thing we thought about when like scaling this model was we needed to give communities kind of this get started package. So we figured it's 21st century and the best way to do that is through an app. So we called it Gardener. We took out all the vowels. Um, and our slogan is date your diet. So we'd like to reinvent local food relationships and systems. Um, so one of our main pillars was the idea of social ownership um, and creating this community where you can feel like you can get access to land as well as other people willing to give their time and space. So I'll let you. Yeah, so the core of supporting everything else we want, social ownership, sustainability, is connecting people who have that space with people who have the time. And once we start facilitating those connections, then we can foster a community that is sharing their knowledge, uh, sharing what works and what doesn't, and finding the right people in the community. And also, eventually, an app like this would support some type of content generation. So if you were logged onto the app, you could also see how-tos on certain aspects of gardening, uh, read people's blog posts, cooking blogs, possibly, as well. And um, I'm going to pass it back to yeah. you. Sorry, so like. <laughs> So yeah, so I mean the idea is that like it, by, by downloading this app and by partaking in this kind of community sharing of, of your space and your time, you have access to things like maybe a 10 mile diet or you know, the, the best way to make a beet soup from Judy's garden. Or, um, so the idea is that we're going to be building people, food, places all together through this kind of how to and how to connect people through, uh, through this wonderful incentive. So. So again, uh, the objective today, I remind you, was to run through this method of, of design thinking, to first live through empathy, define a problem, ideate a bunch of ideas, pick one, prototype it. As I said, it doesn't really matter whether your ideas were really good or really bad. In the end, as Edison used to say, I have not failed. I've only found 10,000 ways that won't work. So maybe these are three ways that won't work. Now we can eliminate them. Or maybe there's an actual great idea among these ideas, and we can actually put it to fruition and develop uh, your, your, your model a bit for, further.